السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وكفى وسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى لا سيما المصطفى صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Dear brothers and sisters, welcome to a new edition of Ask Huda I begin by praising Allah the Almighty alone and sending the best peace and blessings upon his most beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I just have a couple of pending questions from the previous episode, and I would be more than happy, inshallah, to take your live calls on phone number, area code 002-023855-248 or 249. The first question is, <clears throat> Allah makes the hearts of the non-Muslims hard. Can we as Muslims make dua for Allah to protect us from this? As far as hardening the hearts, uh, the hardness of the hearts is not physical, rather it is spiritual. So that maybe they're functioning properly and the people who have such hearts, the non-believers are physically fit and sporty people. But when it comes to accepting the truth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Like they have locks over their hearts. They are not open to receive the truth. The receptors are blocked. And he said in Surah Al-Baqarah in verse number 74 about Bani Israel, after many signs and verses that Moses, peace be upon him, have shown them, he said, ثُمَّ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مِنْ بَعْدِ ذَلِكَ فَهِيَ كَالْحِجَارَةِ then your hearts have hardened after all. It has become as hard as the stones or even harder. Then he went further more to explain that some of the stones split asunder to water gush forth from beneath it, from between them, uh, and so on. But their hearts... The hearts of those who have seen all the signs of Prophet Musa السلام, and they still denied, neglected them, and argued with him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said about them, فَهِيَ كَالْحِجَارَةِ أَوْ أَشَدُّ قَسْوَةِ فِي سُورَةِ الْأَنْعَامِ in verse number 43, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا إِلَىٰ أُمَمٍ مِّنْ قَبِلِكَ فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِالْبَأْسَاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَضَرَّعُونَ فَلَوْلَا إِذْ جَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا تَضَرَّعُوا وَلَكِنْ قَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Allah tells Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم that we have sent and appointed prophets to nations before you. And we tested them with hardship, with calamities, with adversities, so that they would resort and seek shelter with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and beg him for mercy. But in instead, فَلَوْلَا إِذْ جَاءَهُمْ بَأْسُنَا تَضَرَّعُوا وَلَكِنْ Instead of begging Allah for help and resorting unto him, قَسَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ Their hearts have hardened. وَزَيَّنَ لَهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ and Satan made it seem fair to them, their evil doing. The Prophet ﷺ said that our hearts do rust like metals. And he said the heart is sound and clear until one commits a sin. It leaves behind a black dot. If the person rushes to ask Allah for forgiveness and haste to repent, it will be erased and remitted, and the heart will remain clean and bright. But if the person neglects that sin, then instead he commits another sin. It adds up another dot, and another dot, and another dot, until the heart is completely darkened, 
and such heart would be a hard heart would not recognize what's right from what's wrong except what it seems okay to his desire so if he desires something then it should be okay if he does not like it it should be haram haram and halal lawful and unlawful would be according to the desire of the person who possesses such heart so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam brings to our attention the importance of upon committing a sin one should haste to ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness and repent unto him in order to maintain the soundness of his heart allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونٌ إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٌ In the invocation of Prophet Abraham, peace be upon him, when he said, وَلَا تُخْزِنِي يَوْمَ يُبْعَثُونَ Do not disgrace me on the day of resurrection, when you resurrect your servants. يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بَنُونَ On that day, neither wealth nor children will avail an art, except for one who comes to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and is presented before him on that day بِقَلْبٍ salim with a sound heart that's why it does not amaze us to know that the most frequently recited dua by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was Allahumma ya muqallib al-qulub thabbit qalbi ala deenik so yes sister we should actually ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala not occasionally Rather, on a regular basis, as the Prophet ﷺ used to do, to protect our hearts from deviating, to protect our hearts from getting hard and harsh, and to protect our hearts against sins. Allahumma ameen. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, Our body is like a kingdom, a dominion, and the king of this kingdom is the heart. ألا وإن في كل جسد مضى إذا صلحت صلح الجسد كله وإذا فسدت فسد الجسد كله ألا وهي القلب The heart determines whether the person uh, is on the straight path or is a deviant The sound heart would make the person a devout worshiper and obedient servant to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but the person whose heart is deviant, then would not recognize what's right from what's bad. He would only do whatever he or she desires. May Allah protect us against that. The second pending question is, I have some money in a bank. I will rue it in order to buy a lot of land for investment. Do I pay zakah for this? Okay. When somebody buys a property for investment, would like to ask what kind of investment first. If somebody is going to buy a property and build a skyscraper, he would have a hundred or two hundred units, flats, apartments that he is going to rent. There is no zakah due on the building itself, on the property. Rather, the zakah will be on the income from the rent, the net income, the net profit after the expenses and the utilities and, and the fees and wages, the net profit would pay if it remains after one complete lunar year, Islamic year, then we estimate how much is it. If it uh, equals the nisab or exceeds it, then it is the catapult, 2.5%. But somebody bought a property and he built it uh, and uh, he did not rent it. It's sitting there, nor is he selling it. So. He did not intend to sell it, rather he built it for himself, for his family members, for his children. When they grow up, there is no zakah on that. The zakah will be on cash or investment which is prepared for sale. Wallahu ta'ala, a'la wa a'lam. Uh, out of the emails, we have very interesting questions. One of them I would like to begin with. Uh, it came to my mailbox on my website, ijaza.com. Uh, the email... The sister says, I follow the sheikh that all the brothers said he is a trustworthy. I used to listen to his lectures and go to his classes when he was in town. However, those same brothers who initially referred me to him now say that he is no longer a trustworthy sheikh and he was really a wolf in sheep's clothing, trying to trick us. 
I feel that my faith is really affected now as I no longer know who to trust. Please help. Number one, I recall here right now the statement of Al Imam Malik ibn Anas, alayhi rahmatullah. May Allah have mercy on him. Al Imam Malik, uh, of course, they used to say about him, لا يفتى ومالك في المدينة. He was the greatest Imam and Mufti of his time. And he was the Imam of the city of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam during his time. The greatest Faqih. He stood once facing the grave of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he made this very important and amazing remark. He said, كل إنسان يؤخذ منه ويرد عليه إلا صاحب هذا المقام. Every man, his opinion could be right or could be wrong. We may take it, we may reject it, except for one person, the person who's lying down in this grave. That is Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa He was the last infallible creature, the last infallible prophet. No one after Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is infallible. All of us uh, are born with this human nature which is inclined to sin and do mistakes or do errors. Even the most righteous one of us, when it comes to passing a judgment, when it comes to concluding a solution for a mas'ala, the imam or the sheikh or the faqih may make ishtihad and uh, resort to the right view and may he, he may end up actually concluding the wrong one. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, إِذَا اشْتَهَدَ الْحَاكِمُ فَأَصَابْ فَلَهُ أَجْرَانْ وَإِذَا اشْتَهَدَ فَأَخْطَأْ فَلَهُ أَجْرٌ وَاحِدٌ If the hakim, and it refers to either the ruler or the judge or the scholar in an issue or a mas'ala, contemporary issue, it did not have precedence at the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or the time of his rightly guided khulafa, so we don't know what to do with it. So the scholar makes ijtihad based on the knowledge that he possessed. If he fulfilled the conditions of ijtihad and he's qualified, he makes ijtihad. Then he comes up with an opinion. If his opinion happened to coincide the truth, then he receives double reward. The reward for making ijtihad, the effort, and the reward of reaching the right conclusion or for the reaching the right conclusion but if he makes ishtihad and he does not match the truth or his opinion does not coincide with the truth then he will still receive one for reward for making the effort and this this hadith is more than enough to tell us that even the scholars are subject to error they make, may make errors Unfortunately, some seekers of knowledge, uh, students who happen to start reading a few books, if they do not like the view of the sheikh or some of the shiuch, they oppose them. They oppose them in public. And they may create their own websites and start attacking them, spreading rumors about them, to the extent that we see some even judging some scholars as they are non-Muslims anymore. They are rebellious, al-fasiqeen, al-kuffar, all of that. This is a dilemma. Not only that, after they have been advising people to listen to that particular sheikh, then all of a sudden, now they are circulating the rumor or asking everybody not to listen to him because he was a wolf in a sheep's clothing. Uh, we need to learn as an audience as a seeker of knowledge, I heard what the people say about a particular person, whether this person is a scholar, a local imam or a sheikh, or an ordinary person, a layman. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in this regard, in Surah Al-Hujurat, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ بِنَبَأٍ فَتَبَيَّنُوا أَنْ تُصِيبُوا قَوْمًا بِجَهَالَةٍ فَتُصْبِحُوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلْتُمْ نَادِمِينَ Or you who believe, if a rebellious man comes to you with some news, 
This news will require you to take an action. Before taking an action, you must verify the news, lest you may hurt somebody out of ignorance or based on false informations, and eventually you will end up regretting so. The ayah was revealed because the Prophet ﷺ have deployed one of his companions to collect the zakah fund, the sadaqah, from uh, one tribe. As he approached them, they were very keen to receive him. So they went out to receive him. He saw that he thought wrongfully that they're coming after him. So he ran away. And when he went to the Prophet ﷺ, he said, Ya Rasulullah, these guys have converted from Islam and declared kuf, and they were about to kill me. So the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sent an expedition under the leadership of Khalid ibn al-Walid, may Allah be pleased with him, and he said, do not attack them, just wait until you verify whenever it's a prayer time. See if they pray or not. Verify the news. So when Khalid ibn al-Walid came there, he noticed that they called the Adhan, and they called the Iqamah, and they prayed in congregation. So he went to the Prophet Sallallahu and the tribe and their leader came to the Prophet Sallallahu and they explained to him that the confusion which was taking place. Imagine if the Prophet Sallallahu based his decision on the rumor or the misunderstanding of this companion. And that's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala said, إِنْ جَاءَكُمْ فَاسِقٌ And this guy was a companion. Because he did not verify the news, he thought so. So it could be somebody whom we trust so much. But if he spreads a rumor without its verification, then he's a fasiq. He is rebellious. Because that, cause, that causes a destruction of the entire community. Every person has a problem with the shaykh or the scholar with the <coughs> would spread a rumor about him and will end up losing trust in our shaykh and our leaders exactly like what's happening uh, uh, in the church with the priests. This is not the case. Now I would like also to address the imams and the scholars. Our greatest role model was Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa and no one loved anyone as much as the companions of Prophet Muhammad loved them. They actually were willing and they did give their lives as a sacrifice for his life, sallallahu alayhi wa Yet, once he was escorting Safiya, and we all know that it was night and she was wearing a full niqab. So he noticed that there were two companions across the street. He stopped them and he said, Ala rislikuma. He approached them, he said, wait a minute. He approached them and he said, she's my wife, Safiya. He said, Ya Rasulullah, Subhanallah. They were amazed. Why did you have to explain to us? Uh, we would never have any doubt uh, that you're not doing anything wrong. And of course, it must be your wife. He said, no, it is not like that. Inna shaytana yajri min abni adam majrat dami. I will explain that after this phone call, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum. Mukhtar uh, from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, thank you. I, I met you during the Ramadan, uh, during Umrah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we went to the same Bible show to cut our hair after the talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, my question, uh, Sheikh, is if you ask a uh, a scholar, uh, a fatwa, then he gives you the answer. Uh, that answer is not comfortable with you. you. What do you do? You go to another sheikh? Okay. Uh, uh, based on what you did not feel comfortable, Ya Mukhtar? Uh, for example, there are certain issues that have different opinions. Okay. So the difficulty is which one do you choose? You find that um, somebody will tell you, if you do it this way, it's the best. Somebody else will say, no, this is the best. Mm -hmm. And they all try to give you their own uh, 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 justification from the hadith or from the some books they have read. Mm -hmm. uh, some tafsir. Yeah. So what do you do in such circumstance? You have different opinions from different scholars. I okay. believe your question is relating to our subject. So inshallah, I will address that right now. Inshallah, Azza wa Jal. Masha'Allah. Barakallah. Shukran, Shaykh. Afwan.
So again, the sheikh or the imam or the scholar must avoid the suspicious places, suspicious activities, and uh, suspicious statements which may be uh, carried uh, on the wrong understanding, or misunderstood. The sheikh must understand that he's not an ordinary person in a sense that whatever he says, a lot of people will learn from him. And they're going to quote him saying, the sheikh said so and so. So we have to be uh, aware of that. If the best of the best, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa have to prove himself before his companions that she's my wife, she's Safiya. Uh, when they said, no, 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 we'll never think bad of you. He said, no, because Satan uh, is actually in everybody's body like the blood flowing in our veins and arteries. So shaitan may come to you and whisper to you and say, look, the sheikh is walking in the street with a woman. Who is this woman? Maybe she's a girlfriend. Could any person think so? Think so? It happened. And that's why Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa is sitting the best example that a person has to make sure that he is clear and his record is clean before people, especially if he's in the position of leadership. What if we differ with the sheikh? We need to verify that. Did you really say that? And on what basis? What's your perspective? What's your proof? And we may consult another sheikh. What if he has a different view than uh, all the other sheikh? No problem. It is possible as long as this understanding is based on a proof or on a valuable understanding. Uh, we should not exceed the limit and go all the way. If this guy does not agree with what we think or does not say what we like, then we say that he is a wolf in the sheep's clothing and you should neglect him and start warning people against him. What really determines whether the person should be uh, avoided or not if this person is confirmed to be of a corrupt aqidah, for instance, a man who is spreading and propagating bid'ah, or an agent, an agent who is misleading the ummah, working for whatever is just getting paid. Can, can, can a scholar or a seeker of knowledge be like that? You never know. We have to be cautious. We have to be careful but not based on rumors. We have to verify, even in the case of the Murtad, if somebody has a confusion, we're required to remove these misconceptions from the mind of the person before uh, we say, why did you do that? And we punish him or her. So the Imam is more worthy than others that we have to ask him personally and ask other respected scholars or shiuch in the region who are aware of him. If they confirm, khalas. It's not my job to spread the rumors anymore. Rather, I would follow a trustworthy sheikh, and this is not the end of life. And why this would make your iman weak? If we all know that the Prophet ﷺ used to ask Allah frequently to keep his heart firm and steadfast on the straight path, people do change. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to keep our hearts firm on the straight path. Mukhtar is also saying that what if I ask a sheikh a question? And he gives me an answer that I do not feel comfortable with. Based on what? After this phone call. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Layla from Yemen. Assalamu alaikum. Yes. <coughs> How are you, Sheikh? Great. Are you guys free yet? <laughs> no, alhamdulillah. Everything is fine. Working on it? Okay. Yes. Uh, Sheikh, uh, I want to thank you for answering our question. Wa jazakum. Yes, I have two questions. Um, the first one is... Uh, what so so this, is how you, this is how you thank me for answering the question by presenting two more questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to ask, what makes someone mushrik? Okay. Uh, Christians, you know, believe in Son of God, make, uh, believe in uh, Mother of God. Does that make them mushrik? <clears throat> okay. And the second question is, um, in Islam... Men and women each have their special goals in life. So I want to know if men have a greater role and if they have a greater reward in the hereafter. Because in the Quran, all the verses that describe the bounty of the hereafter seem to be addressed to men, you know, like um, have their promise made, in, for example, and there is nothing special mm -hmm. mentioned for women. So I want to, uh, like, I hope you'll clarify this particular difference in reward for a sheikh. Okay. I got your questions, Sister Layla. Thank you so much. 
May Allah spread peace in Yemen and protect the Yemeni people and all the Muslim Ummah. Amen. So back to Mukhtar's question. You don't feel comfortable with his reply or answer. Based on what? Based on how? Or you think this guy is not trustworthy or he's not a scholar, he's half a scholar, he's just starting to learn. Then it's your fault from the beginning to ask somebody who is not professional, who's not uh, an official sheikh, uh, did not acquire the proper education. As we always say, if somebody is having any ache or pain or disease, they go to the proper physician, to the specialist. If uh, somebody's car broke down, they go to a mechanic, not to a plumber. If somebody needs a fatwa on a particular issue, you as a specialized sheikh. And the sheikh does not know all the religious knowledge. Somebody will be specialized in inheritance law. And there are some sheikh who are great in hadith and tafsir, but when it comes to inheritance law, say, you know what? Uh, refer the question to brother so and so or such and such sheikh. Uh, we respect our uh, professional fields and speciality. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted us uh, to address people. And this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask us about this responsibility because somebody can may give a fatwa because he's embarrassed to say, I don't know, and he end up uh, misleading people. So he goes astray and he misleads others as well. Assalamu alaikum. Khidr from KSA. Assalamu alaikum Khidr. Um, okay, uh, three times I've asked you this question. And no problem, inshallah. I'll ask again. It's about sick of music. The, sick, the ruling on music, is it... Um, and uh, maybe 30 times, 300 times the question was answered. Yeah. No, uh, music... No, I meant I mean, like on Huda. Yes, on Huda. Oh, yeah, music in Islam is not permitted. No Musical instruments is not permitted. Only the daf in weddings and holiday no, no, and no, no, no. Um, I, like, uh, I, I follow the ruling that music is not um, permissible at all, including the vocals. Is that, um, is there an exception to music? Including? Inclu uh, no, I'm, I follow that music is not allowed at all. So what is the question then? Um, is like vocals allowed? Vocals, it's human vocals. Okay, human vocal, or yeah. what they call it, percussion. Uh, yeah. Okay, there is a difference of opinions in this regard. And Allah knows best if it is accompanied with regular nasheed, halal nasheed, there is no problem with that. Yes. And that too was answered before Khidr. Jazakallah khair. I hope you got the answer. <coughs> Another phone call. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> Sister Bil Qais from uh, Nigeria. Yes, Bil Qais. My own is not really a question, it's a request. I, I want you to put in your prayers for Allah, one or other, that bless you with the fruit of the womb. I believe you said that you're requesting an invocation or a prayer for what? Yes, sir. For, to Allah, one or give me a child. To give you a child? May Allah grant you a goodly offspring. May Allah grant you a goodly offspring. And please make this dua very often. Rabbana hab lana min azwajina wa dhurriyatina qurrata a'yunin wa ja'anna lil muttaqina imama. This is also a verse towards the end of Surah Al Furqan, chapter Al Furqan. Our Lord grant us from our spouses and offspring comfort for our eyes and make us leaders for the pious people. Okay? And uh, I hope that the audience as well and the viewers are praying for you and for every couple who are trying to have a child. May Allah grant you a goodly offspring, not just a child. Okay? Thank you, Sister Abul Qais. <coughs> okay, I guess uh, we need to take a short break. Inshallah, we'll resume afterwards, so stay tuned. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. So Mukhtar was asking about if you consult a shaykh or ask him for a fatwa and you don't like it. Uh, my only concern is when you ask the proper fatwa committee or council and you get a fatwa and you don't like it, you may be one of those categories who are 
fatwa shoppers. They keep asking people after people, shiuch after shiuch, the same question over and over. Now it's not for the purpose of learning the hukm. Rather, is either to say after the hukm is released, but Sheikh so and so said the opposite in order to create uh, this trouble. Or you hear a word from a Sheikh uh, on another Sheikh. Or you keep shopping for a fatwa until you get the one which you like. Not necessarily you, but we see this a lot. Almost every Islamic center or MSA and any college, university in North America I visited, there are a few questions which are typical that if I'm not asked about them, I would feel that there's something missing. I'm in somewhere but not in North America. Such as halal meat and haram meat. And such as uh, recently in the past approximately seven years, whether buying a house on a mortgage with mortgage, riba is halal because we live here or not. So these two main issues are always raised. Even though the, the, the matter has been decided and the fatwa committees have issued, and the AMJA have already issued the clear answer to these questions. And everybody knows it. But it's like a recycle. We keep hearing this over and over and over. A person who is sincere in learning the answer, you consult the proper sheikh, and once you get an answer supported by sound hadith, reverse, that's it. Wallahu ta'ala, a'la wa a'lam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Muhammad, United Arab Emirates, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalamu alaikum. How are you, Muhammad? Alhamdulillah, Sheikh uh, Salah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for spreading the message that is spreading. Alhamdulillah. Uh, Sheikh, I had a question actually for you. Please. Uh, we recently got uh, 10 volumes of uh, you know, Tafsir, uh, Ibn Kathir. Mm. And we're planning to read it. Yeah. Uh, my question was, uh, can this Tafsir be read while lying down on the bed? Or uh, is it necessary that you have to be in Wudu when you're reading the Tafsir? The English version of it is. Okay. I'm reading the English version, but there is mention of, you know, some ayahs of Quran are there in Arabic there. Okay. But, uh, <coughs> most of it is in English here. The complete explanation of the ayahs, it's all in English. Okay. So can that be read while lying down on bed, and, uh, or is it compulsory to uh, read it sitting the way we read Quran and with the Buddha and all? Okay. Muh uh, Muhammad, I would answer first by saying okay. what's necessary and what's permissible, but after this phone call. So you can just hang up and inshallah I will answer you. Mardiana from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, Dr. Salah. Yes. I have, I have one simple question. Um, I, have a, I bought a hook. Uh, and the hook, uh, they have this Mickey Mouse picture, you know, mm -hmm. uh, with eyes. Uh, is it for, um, uh, is it permitted to to have the hook keep in the house? Okay. Yeah. Keep in the book in the house, no problem with that, because it is not displayed nor hung against the wall. Okay. 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 Barakallah fikum, Sister Mardiana. Thank you, Muhammad again from United Arab Emirates, uh, is reading the Tafsir book, uh, whether in Arabic or in English. While lying down or reclining on bed. Permissible? Yes, it is permissible. As a matter of fact, the dhikr, general dhikr, the absolute dhikr, remembrance of Allah, including the recitation of the Quran, or making tasbih, etc., is permissible to do it while reclining, while lying down, while on lying down on a side. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقُعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ سورة آل عمران uh, Those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala قِيَامًا while standing وَقُعُودًا while sitting down وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ while they're reclining on their sides If you feel comfortable doing so Is it permissible? It is permissible what about uh, having wudu or ablution? Is it required or necessary to read the tafsir? No, it is not required. It is not required. When I say required, it means it's a must. No, it is not a must. For just touching the Quran, yes. 
But here, what is the proper etiquette? What's recommended? It is recommended to maintain a state of purity from major and minor impurities while making general dhikr or reciting the Quran or reading in the books of seerah or tafsir or knowledge. Some of the scholars used to make sure that they will have wudu before they quote a hadith. They say, how can I say, qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and his words will be on my tongue while I'm not in a state of complete purity. That is recommended. This is the proper etiquette, but it is not a must. I hope the answer is clear. <clears throat> Abu Bak from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sir, my question is about uh, the Umrah and marriage. Uh, my first question about Umrah is that uh, uh, what is the excellence of performing Umrah in Ramadan? This is a question about Umrah. And uh, my second question is about marriage is that why does Sharia ruling can marry a woman while intending to divorce her uh, after a certain period of time? This is uh, after? Thank you very much. Uh, Abu Bakr, marrying uh, a divorcee after? Hello? Marrying a divorcee after what? I said, what is the Sharia ruling concerning? A, a, a man who marries a woman while intending to divorce her after a certain time. Ah, I see. Okay. And does he declare this intention to her? Oh, can you hear me? Okay. Answer the inshallah Azza <clears throat> Jal. Okay. We have uh, Sister Layla first from Yemen. She said, what makes a man mushrik? Mushrik is from shirk, and shirk is to sit partners to Allah in worship. Let's answer this uh, by presenting a very straightforward hadith in this regard. The Prophet ﷺ asked Mu'adh ibn Jabal, O oh, Mu'adh, do you know what's Allah's right upon his servants? He says, Allah and his messenger know best. He said that they should worship him alone and not to sit partners to him in worship. Then the next question was, O oh, Mu'adh, and do you know what's Allah, what, what, are, what are the servants' rights upon Allah? He answered the same. Allah and his messenger know best. He said, not to punish them or to enter them into his paradise and so on. So what's required from us is to worship Allah alone. Surah Al-Bayna says, وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُوا اللَّهَ مُخْلِصِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ حُنَفَاءَ Number one, to worship Allah alone, sincerely, with sincere devotion, without certain partners to Him in worship. And that begins by nullifying and negating any possibility that anyone deserves to be worshipped other than Allah. And that's why the word of Tawheed consists of number one, negation. La ilaha. There is no God. Then, affirmation. Illa Allah. And, that statement by itself is insufficient. If somebody says, I believe in one God, as we hear a lot in interfaith dialogues, we are monotheistic people, we believe in monotheism. What about Prophet Muhammad? Where does he fit in your life? What do you believe about him? Well, we believe in all the prophets, but not Muhammad, because he's a prophet of the Arab, and, and we don't know much about him. The Prophet ﷺ said, any person, whether a Jew or a Christian, hears of me, about me, the proper statement, knows about me and does not believe in me, then will never find the fragrance of paradise. It's a, it's a, this is a done deal. Belief and monotheism means to believe in Allah alone as the creator, as the Lord, the sustainer, and the only one who no one is ever similar, nor equivalent or comparable to him. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is his last messenger. Okay? The second question I will answer after this phone call, inshallah. Dhiya uh, from KSA. Assalamu alaikum, Dhiya. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, how are you? Great, alhamdulillah, wa shukrillah. Sheikh, I want to ask you that uh, in Arab countries over here, mm. it is very common to have maids, female maids in the home. Mm. 
So does not it uh, contravene this uh, basic Islamic principle that uh, a woman should not be exposed to non-mahram? Yeah. But let me ask you a question first. Yeah. Do Arab necessarily represent Islam? They're supposed to. Right? Yeah. Similarly, Pakistani Muslims, Indian Muslims, Malaysian Muslims, they're supposed to present Islam. But I don't mean that only Arab. I mean anywhere. Okay. Now if I'm going to answer your question, inshallah. If hired mm. in a home, yeah. so all those male people in that home. Is it halal? Is it permissible yes. for a woman who does not have a mahram to work as a maid in somebody's house yeah. without a mahram where she right. may end up staying alone with a man in that house? No, it is not permissible. The Prophet ﷺ prohibited that. Whether she is old or young, beautiful or have and have or ugly, and Nabi ﷺ prohibited having a man and a woman behind closed doors without an official relationship or mahramiyyah, they're not related to each other, nor are they husband and wife. And a lot of problems, including adultery, are the results of such uh, violation in addition to having these uh, women whether young or old as I say travel alone from their countries and stay in somebody's house without a male mahram Islam does not approve that Wallahu ta'ala a'la wa a'lam Layla second question she said about a man and a woman in Islam do they have the same role do they get the same reward I have a few verses I would like to present to answer this question immediately so that the answer is presented to Muslims and non-Muslims, men and women. The, uh, the question actually was asked by Umm Salama, may Allah be pleased with her, that how come that men are always mentioned in the Quran, Ya ayuhalladina amanu in, in the masculine, what about women? Uh, what happened to us? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the verse of Surah Al-Ahzab which says إِنَّ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَالْمُسْلِمَاتِ وَالْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ وَالْقَانِتِينَ وَالْقَانِتَاتِ وَالصَّادِقِينَ وَالصَّادِقَاتِ To the end of the verse he said أَعَدَّ لَهُمْ مَغْفِرَةً وَأَجْرًا عَظِيمًا The verse is long because we're running out of time. It's verse number 35 of Surah Al-Ahzab in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala emphasized verily Muslim men and women, believers, men and women, قانتين, devout men and women, fasting men and women uh, uh, truthful men and women but then he said he has prepared for all of them whether men or women and prepare for them forgiveness and a great reward not only that now we go by to surah al-nahla verse number 97 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said man amila salihan min dhakarin aw untha wa huwa mu'minun فَلَنُحْيِيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبَةً وَلَنَجِزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجْرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ This is a fantastic verse. Islam came to set the rules that as far as actions, reward and punishment, duties and takalif and hukuk, there is no difference between a male and a female. Everybody is equal before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى Whosoever does good, righteous deeds, whether a male or a female, وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنْ While in a state of Iman فَلَنُحْيِيَنَّهُ حَيَاةً طَيِّبَةً The first word that will be rewarded in this life with a goodly life وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجَرَهُمْ And we shall reward them and give them, pay them their wages according to the best of what they used to do وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَجَرَهُمْ بِأَحْسَنِ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُهُمْ I remember here also Aisha radiyallahu ta'ala anha wa allaha saying, Ya Rasulullah, nara al-jihad afdal al-amal afala nujahid. We hear you Allah talking about the verses of jihad and fighting for the cause of Allah on the battlefield, the enemies, etc. Why only men get to join the battlefield? Why not us? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Lakunna afdal al-jihad hajjun mabroor. So for women, when they perform a proper hajj, that counts as a jihad fi sabilillahi azza wa jal. So, uh, the last statement, as far as reward, as far as takalif, as far as appreciating our good deeds, there is no difference between a man and a woman. Everybody in life has a role to play, maybe different due to the physiological nature, the physical nature, the emotional nature, 
uh, even in the ibadat but by the end before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we're all equal as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said inna akramakum عند الله اتقاكم Brothers and sisters, we ran out of time once again. This is the tradition of our worldly life. But until next time, I leave you in the care of Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah is my heart's speech Your mercy is what I beseech Keep in my heart your remembrance and in your deen allow me to advance. Help me in my quest, permit me to pass the ultimate.